Okay, good Friday morning, everyone, and welcome to the 200th episode of the Backyard Naturalist. Uh, everything about this community has brought me joy over the past four years, and I feel honored and humbled to be able to spend time with you here every Friday morning, learning 9 a.m. This is where um, I really enjoy being on Friday mornings um, is with you all. So uh, normally this is where I give thanks to subscribers and accolades and talk about astronomical events, um, but I also only have five minutes to speak. And so first question, this is a representation of some yummy food stuff. It is also a representation of fuel. It's food and fuel. And in a sense, all food is fuel to something. That's why it's food. It fuels bodies. Um, not all fuel is food for everything. So here we have three fuels for humans and other animals, corn, sugar, and soy. And um, one of these is a, is a past backyard naturalist featured organism, and the other two are future ones. So um, these are foods that many humans on the planet eat for growth and sustenance and um, making cavities and uh, are essentially what is happening is our bodies are breaking down the component structures of these plants for nutrients and fiber and other things. And so um, we humans then have also figured out that in addition to fueling our bodies, these same plants can fuel our machines. So sugar, corn, and soy can all make ethyl alcohol or ethanol, uh, which are used as biofuels. And I remember learning at a very early age from my grade school friends, probably, uh, in a kind of don't try this at home moment, that if you take sugar and you sprinkle it on a hot stovetop burner, it is highly combustible. And our engines in our cars are combustion engines. And so, you know, the sugar, even without any processing, the sugar forms these little sparks. And I even had plans to use sugar as a special effects explosive in my first breakthrough movie uh, that I was going to make with my neighbor, Nick Natarelli. And I was just going to like blow up sugar everywhere. That just seemed to make sense since, since I knew that sugar could do that. Um, when we eat these foods, our bodies use many parts of the plant, uh, but because they are plants and our bodies were mammals, we can't break down, or animals, we can't break down the cellulose in the cell walls in plants. So we need help for that. But in a laboratory or a factory, uh, cell walls can be broken down into fuel. So similar to how you put gasoline into your car, um, the gasoline comes from crude oil and crude oil has hydrocarbons, so hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Um, and that's broken down. And depending on the number of carbon atoms, uh, it's gonna be butane or propane or methane. Um, and uh, in, that, in the same way, plants are also made from hydrocarbons. So the fossil fuels are just these hydrocarbons that have gone through a long process of, of turning into crude oil. But it's the same basic stuff of life, the hydrogen, the carbon, the oxygen in the plants, we can break down into uh, the hydrocarbons that we use for fuel. So it's usually broken down, you usually add uh, yeast, the yeast ferments into alcohol, and um, those component parts are refined for fuel. So, you know, ethanol, biodiesel, can this can be treated the same way as the fossil fuels, the the crude oil, um, and one of the one of the byproducts for this in the plant in the biofuel sense is lignin. And a few weeks ago, did a episode on vanilla, and lignin is an excellent building material for artificial vanilla. Uh, the lignin byproduct um, is also in uh, has a lot of potential for fueling these very same factories. Um, that are processing the biofuels. So that's something that's already separate from the, the, the crude oil refineries is that the, the, the waste products of the biofuels can be used as a fuel to fuel the plant. So already what you have is a potentially much more efficient system um, in, in place with the biofuels. Uh, 
So one of the ways that fuels in general are categorized is by how much energy you get out based on how much energy you put in, just the simple math. Um, and so we do have kind of a, I, I guess, a featured organism today and, the, and that's switchgrass. So switchgrass is not food for humans. Um, it's been used as food for animals, for, for, for grazing animals. Um, and this is a species that has very, very high potential as a clean, efficient, and stable source of biofuel at a time when it is so important that we eliminate our dependency on fossil fuels. Um, so not just from a climate perspective, but also you know from a global conflict perspective, because oil is fueling more than just our cars. Uh, it's it's releasing greenhouse, you know, and which are releasing greenhouse gases. Um, but oil also, whoops, fuels uh, wars and global conflict, and it takes 10 million years for crude oil to form. So not, not at all a renewable source. So um, a renewable resource. So one benefit that makes switchgrass so promising is not only is it a native plant here anyway, um, and you know we all know about the benefits of native plants, but switchgrass has also been shown to be very effective and healing at, at healing and restoring marginalized or eroded soils. There's a lot of uh, land around the world that needs to be healed and switchgrass is, shows a lot of promise here in the Americas as a native plant that can really help regenerate and restore soils. Um, it can be grown around the world. Uh, if we did that, in, in some places it is considered a weed. And so in, in some places around the world, it would surely could surely have the potential to become invasive. Um, it's already popular as an ornamental plant. Um, and uh, it also has a potential problem if, if it becomes very profitable as a fuel then maybe you start getting people that are would you know cut down forests to 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 use this as a fuel. Um, but uh, one of the other big problems is that it is currently very expensive with current technology to convert switchgrass to fuel, um, and it's still a process that releases carbon dioxide into the air. Um, and uh, but again, here in the Americas, it's native, it grows quickly, it's resistant to drought. A really big advantage of this over other biofuels is uh, not only that it heals the land, but it doesn't need fertilizers. So it's drought resistant, doesn't need fertilizers or the resource to grow. Um, it's a very low input and very high output, which then leads to much fewer emissions and much more efficient fuel. And the potential is very, very high for output. So again, you think about how much energy you put in versus comes out. When you look at crude oil or the gasoline, it actually produces less energy than you put into it. So for every one unit of energy of gas, about 80% of that is, is, you know, is becomes uh, yield or output. So you're actually getting less than you put in. With switchgrass, for every one unit of energy you put into the process, you get 10 times the energy output. So it's not a completely closed loop. You still need the resources to put in, but what you're getting is a thousand percent potentially versus 80%. So you're actually, you know, much, much, much uh, higher energy output. Um, and, and even when compared to other biofuels, um, what we just haven't figured out that is that sweet spot. Uh, it's it's very expensive currently to get the enzymes that are needed to break down the cellulose. Um, and so, you know, we need to either figure out how to use fewer enzymes or figure out a cheaper way of producing these enzymes. Um, also, currently, most ethanol products can't be shipped in pipelines, particularly switchgrass, too corrosive. Um, so you're potentially shipping it by trucks or rail, which, uh, you know, that requires fuel in itself and it lowers the efficiency. And then you always have to look into the problem of land use. So if you're growing plants on land to be used for energy, you're taking away land that could be used to grow food. It gets into the ethical questions. Um, you know, people desperately needed needing to convert land. Um, and then if you know if you're fueling profits this way, uh, and most of us haven't really heard of corn of this versus corn-based ethanol um, because the corn. Uh, lobby is very, very powerful, and they'll give you a million reasons why corn is going to be way better as a biofuel than switchgrass. Um, but the objective data seems to say otherwise. Um, so uh, there's, there's, it's you know, they're 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 closely related, um, switchgrass and corn, and 
there are a lot of other potential biofuels. You have chicken fat, um, you have uh, palm, you have wood chips. And, and we can also kind of think of like not using the com like combustion engine, right? This is this is taking biofuels and putting it into this gasoline kind of engine. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's pretty much where the situation is. Um, and you know we the, the the current system is very broken. It's very unsustainable and very costly in many different ways. Um, but this is one of the many things that we really need to do to. Uh, look at shifting the paradigm in how we're using fuels. I have no idea. I probably went over five minutes, so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and let the cast begin for whoever wants to go next. I That's love chaos. So nicely done. So nicely done. Fabulous. All right, everybody. I am no wizard of Microsoft Paint the way Tim is, so you'll have to excuse my movie cover uh, trailer, but I get to spend the next five minutes talking with you about um, the greatest of snowy mountain ashes, perhaps, um, which is my snowy mountain ash. I realize that this is um, the backyard naturalist, and I'm actually going to hijack it a little bit and... Um, turn it into the front yard naturalist. So I hope that you will all forgive me and be patient. Um, but uh, I just planted a tree in my yard um, and I didn't plant it, someone else planted it for me, but we got a new tree in our yard. And so the research that we did to confirm that this was the tree that we wanted um, is still really fresh in my mind. And uh, when I was thinking about what um, sort of thing I could share with you, um, I decided to literally talk about my yard and um, a cool new species that's there. So this is the snowy mountain ash. Now, I bet you heard the word ash and you're like, hey, Tori, it's cool that you planted a tree, but uh, did you hear about like, you know, ash trees and emerald ash borers, you know, it's like cute. Actually, they're, they're better than cute. They're gorgeous. Emerald ash borers are legit beautiful bugs. Um, but they're, you know, basically eating the inner bark of pretty much any ash tree they can get their hands, six little legs on. So um, have no fear. I did not plant an ash tree in my yard. I already have two street trees that are already ash trees. And um, the thing is that plant, plant names lie all the time, right? Some violets are yellow. Um, a pineapple is not a pine nor an apple. Uh, dogwoods do not bark, um, and corpse flowers are alive, even though they smell like they're dead. Um, so like um, my friend and mentor, Timothy Vargo, and many backyard naturalists before, we're going to look at the um, plant, uh, the plant family tree, or the family tree of this plant. Um, so it is indeed a plant. Um, it's in the plant kingdom, and um, it is one of the dicots, so it has two little leaves when it's baby. Um, beyond that, um, it is uh, it splits it splits from ash tree. So if we follow up um, towards our snowy mountain ash, uh, that one's in the Rosalays order. Um, it's got buckthorn in it, um, but also elms, hackberries, mulberries, lots of other trees that you know. Um, while the ash tree is going down, and that one um, is in a different family, the same family as the asters which is a thing I did not know. Um, continuing up that family tree. Um, so like apples and plums and blackberries and other delicious things, my brand new snowy mountain ash is in the rosaceae family um, while our ash tree friends are in the olive family. And then we get um, down to genus and that's where you see in the um, ash tree family that Fraxinus, those are the things that are getting attacked by our emerald ash borers. And, um, my snowy mountain ash is pretty far away from that in its own um, mountain ash genus and the, the specific species of the showy mountain ash. There's two native species here, but since mine is a showy mountain ash, that's what we're talking about. So the Sorbus de decora, decora, we're gonna go with decora. Um, and so um, you're like, I've never heard of mountain ash. 
And to be honest, neither had I. So when it was recommended to me um, to to that this was going to be our tree, um, I Googled it. And um, first thing that came up was uh, that this tree is actually also called a rowan tree. There's several species um, in uh, Europe that are related, not related um, to, to the two, but still in the same uh, the same grouping. And um, they're called rowan trees. And I was like, oh, okay, this, this is definitely the tree we're going to plant because I have a nephew named Rowan. And uh, did I sneak his photo into this? Yes, I absolutely did. So um, in our yard, we have a Rowan tree, not Rowan in a tree. Although when he calls me on the phone and we're video chatting, he um, has more than once uh, demanded that I go outside and show him his tree and um, asked if he has any other trees as if like, this is not just a Rowan tree, but it belongs to him because he's three and everything belongs to him and he's the most delightful tyrant I've ever known. Um, okay, so why why would you call a Rowan tree a mountain ash? It's not an ash. We already determined that it's really far away. Um, and my guess is honestly that the leaves look very similar and um, that's about where the, the comparison ends, but the leaves do look very similar. They're both toothed leaves, they're both compound leaves. Um, and uh, if you're just looking at those two things, I can see why you'd put them in the same group. Um, but rowan trees only get to be about 20 or 30 feet high. So it's gonna be a very cute little tree in our front yard um, compared with the white and green ash we have around here. Can be 50, 60, even 80 feet high. Um, the flowers are very different. So the flowers of the uh, mountain ash are uh, bug pollinated, uh, beetles, ants, flies, not ants, beetles, flies, bees, um, things like that. And the, the Fraxinus, the ashes are wind pollinated. Um, they're also, most of them are dioecious. So they have male flowers and female flowers and are wind pollinated. Um, their, seed, their seeds are very different too. Um, you've probably seen these little helicoptery samaras of ash trees, um, and uh, you can see the really gorgeous red berries um, that are in that mountain ash picture. Um, and so, I know that when you see those, I'm going to assume that those of you who are birders, um, when you see those uh, berries, you have a very important question in your head, and the answer is yes. Um, specifically exciting because these berries will persist on the branches all winter, at least until they get eaten, um, so that they can be a very popular winter food for lots of creatures. And that was one of the um, big selling points for me when um, we were deciding on tree was something that would be, um, that would, you know, be some reason that I could make friends with my new neighbors, um, at least the feathered ones. Um, but you're like, those are really pretty. Can I eat them? Yes and no. So raw, they're really bitter. They're really sour. You don't want to eat them. But they do have lots of vitamins, uh, vitamins A and C and all sorts of stuff. And it was recommended to me that they can be like cooked into jams and that heating them up um, will kind of get rid of some of that bitterness. And if you add a bunch of sugar, I mean, what could go wrong? Unless you're like Tim and you try to set your stove on fire. Um, so, uh, very excited about having this new tree in my yard. And, um, I also wanted to give a shout out to how and why, um, I, we just planted this, this tree. Um, it's from the branch out program of the Milwaukee water commons. Um, and it's currently available for anybody that lives in the Sherman park neighborhood. So if you take a look at that map, um, from Capitol on down to North Avenue and all the way from 60th street over to, um, lots of different streets, depending on where you are north, south, but um, uh, everyone that I worked with in this program was really great. Um, they sent a forester to come out to my yard and suggest a tree for us after um, a conversation um, and uh, them looking at my yard and, you know, sort of the property around it. And um, if you've ever wanted a forester to come to your, your house and look at your trees and decide, hey, these are ones that could be trimmed and we can we can help you pay for that. Um, or this is a tree we could plant and we could literally just 
pay for it. It was free to plant this tree. Um, or if you just want Caitlin to come over and look at your yard um, because the forester was Caitlin. Uh, I will highly recommend um, the Milwaukee Water Commons uh, branch out program here in Sherman Park. Um, so with that, uh, I will stop talking about mountain ashes and Rowan. Well, I'm not going to stop talking about Rowan. He's too cute. I'm going to talk about him all over the place. But I'm going to pass it off to, I forgot, Maggie. Ah, okay. Sorry. I got to find all my buttons here. Okay. Snapping turtles. Is my camera on? Can you see me? I can't yes. see me. Okay. Oh, how do I go back? Okay. Common snapping turtles. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our friends in our rivers in Milwaukee. Um, so there are two, three species of snapping turtles in the country. Um, two of which are kind of the main species that people tend to get mixed up with one another. Um, they are similar in appearance, but they are not very closely related. Um, the alligator snapping turtles can be um, characterized by their three distinct ridges on their carapace, which is their top shell, um, versus the common snapping turtles, which have the relatively smooth look to their shell. Um, Alligator snapping turtles are more so found in the southeastern part of the country um, and only in the river systems that lead into the Gulf of Mexico. They're also, they also can be much larger and grow much heavier than the common snapping turtles that we see here. Um, common snapping turtles uh, span across the whole eastern half of the country. Um, and they are a little bit smaller, but still can be quite hefty at eight to 14 inches long. Um, and they occupy rivers, ponds, streams. They like shallow waters, murky waters, um, and they do most of their hunting uh, in those shallow waters. So we're gonna be talking about them a little bit today. Um, so some basic anatomy. Uh, like I mentioned, the carapace, which is the top shell, it's a relatively smooth and it has this like toothed ridge above the tail. Um, and like all turtles, the carapace is comprised of scoops, which are essentially bony growths, bony plates. Um, and then underneath they have what's called the plastron, which is their lower shell. Um, this is reduced in size compared to most other turtles, which allows them greater mobility. Um, you'll be able to see that snapping turtles can almost, they almost look like they walk on all fours more closely to like how a mammal would. They, they're able to stand up um, and that's because of that reduced plastron. Um, they have greater mobility, but this also can contribute to more aggression um, and because that's how they protect themselves. Whereas many other turtles, like our box turtle friend here, um, their plastron covers the majority of, of their bottom half. Um, so they're able to retract themselves when they feel threatened. Box turtles are actually able to fully close themselves into their shell um, like a box but other turtles are able to kind of retract within their shell to get that added protection. Whereas the snapping turtles don't have that. So they need to be able to um, protect themselves via other methods. Another important part of their anatomy is their cloaca. Similarly to birds, the cloaca is um, the Part of their anatomy where they excrete feces, urine, um, eggs, as well as where mating takes place. And the cloaca is important in a snapping turtle because they perform what's called cloacal respiration, also known as butt breathing. Um, they need to do this because 
First of all, they're ectothermic, they're reptiles. So the outside temperature controls their inside temperature. So when it's really cold out in the winter, they need to um, go underwater and stay basically above freezing because otherwise they would die. So they, they um, undergo brumation, which is kind of reptiles version of hibernation. Um, this is where their metabolism slows drastically. They require much less oxygen and no food during this time, but they still do drink a little bit and they have some low activity throughout these months. So if you're underwater in the winter time and you're feeling very sluggish because your metabolism is very low, very slow, um, or there's ice cover at the top of the pond that you're in and you're unable to get to oxygen, you're gonna need to still breathe um, because turtles have lungs. Um, and they do this by taking the oxygen from the water and flowing it over um, concentrated areas of blood vessels. And it just so happens that their cloaca is a, a very concentrated area of blood vessels. Um, so therefore that is where they um, intake most of their oxygen when they are in brumation under the water. When they emerge in the springtime, um, females will often travel uh, farther away from their, from their waters um, and that's to lay eggs. And oftentimes this requires them to cross roadways and road mortality is actually one of the leading causes of turtle deaths and causes uh, drastic declines in the snapping turtle population. Um, so if you are to ever see a snapping turtle in the wild that is crossing the road or any turtle for that matter, you're able to help and assist it in crossing the road. Um, you always want to, first off, help a turtle cross the road in the direction that it's traveling. You never, if it's just off the shoulder, you never want to um, turn it around and put it, put it back where it came from because it will just turn back around and continue on its way. Um, you always want to move it in the direction that it's already traveling in. Now with a snapping turtle, uh, it's obviously a little bit more of a daunting task compared to another smaller turtle with less of a beak on it, um, but you are able to still help move them. And the way you wanna do this is by um, grabbing them towards the very back of their shell um, in their carapace. They have kind of these almost little finger hand holes um, where it feels very natural to be able to pick them up there. And by doing this, you're avoiding their very long neck that can swing around to about halfway um, around their body, as well as um, their intense bite. They can bite with up to um, about 50 pounds of force. So you want to avoid their neck, which can stretch um, and their mouth at all costs. Um, and then you can carry them across uh, they can be very heavy, and sometimes they're too big to carry like this. So another method is if you're driving, you can take out the mat in your car or any sort of blanket, shovel, surface like that, and you can just kind of shimmy them from behind onto this um, mat, and then you will want to always keep one hand on the back of their shell so that you have control over the direction of their body. And then if the turtle's traveling to the left here in this picture, you want its head facing away from you and just drag it across. And that's a really helpful way to help turtles cross the road. Um, DNR also has a turtle uh, documentation project where you can actually similar to our um, bird collision project where you can set the GPS coordinates to where you saw the turtle crossing. Um, you're able to do that and then they're able to study where uh, areas of more traffic, more turtle traffic are um, and hopefully aid conservation efforts. 
So we have our very own snapping turtle, common snapping turtle at the Urban Ecology Center who lives in the Riverside Park Animal Room. Um, he is one of our oldest animal ambassadors and he has been a part of the Urban Ecology Center since before it was um, a building. So he's been around for over 20 years. Um, he eats twice per week, a similar diet to what he would find in the wild. Um, he is omnivorous, so he eats greens, produce, as well as protein um, via worms, small mice, and things like that. Um, and then he'll also, we put calcium blocks in our turtle tanks, um, but he chooses to eat his rather than let it kind of dissolve into the water, uh, which is good for him. Um, he also receives regular maintenance and regular enrichment. So enrichment in captive animals is very important to keep their um, morale up, their, their sense of, um, I guess, wildness. Um, you want to stimulate their brains and their bodies um, so that they're able to stay active and happy and healthy. Um, so some of the ways that we do this are when it's nice out, Paul, as well as our other animals in the animal rooms, get to go outside and feel the grass and get the sun outside and the fresh air and we'll hang out with them um, and, and monitor them as they spend time just enjoying the outdoors. Um, in the off season, when it's too cold for them to go outside, we um, actually have an artificial turf that we let them walk around on inside to still get that tactile experience. Paul is seen here with his favorite block. Um, he loves his block. And, uh, you know, there's actually a funny video I could have included of him chasing his block. Um, but just being able to crawl over things and feel different things is important for them. Here's a picture of Paul after he escaped from his little um, enclosure we made where the turf sits in the middle of, of these benches. He had a piece of lettuce in his mouth and he decided he was gonna go run away with his lettuce and enjoy it elsewhere. So we like to let him kind of take free range of the room while we're doing other tasks and um, similar to the other animals too, but we handle him the same way as those um, photos I showed in the previous slide, which is a safe way of handling for both him and his humans. So that's what I have today on snapping turtles. Okay, my turn. Okay. We're going to continue talking about animals you'll find in our, our rivers, but switch it over to something furry. I'm going to talk about the American mink. Um, so, animals of the order carnivora are creatures that specialize primarily in eating flesh. Um, this group contains at least 279 species uh, and includes cats, seals, bears, hyenas, um, canids, and more. Uh, I've talked about several of them in previous episodes, uh, but today we'll focus on the family Mustelidae. Um, minks fall within this family. Um, these mammals all share characteristics of their skull and their teeth. Um, and this family includes otters, badgers, weasels, ferrets, Martins, um, and wolverines. The American mink is a semi-aquatic species that's native to North America, and they are commonly found in nearshore areas of oceans, lakes, rivers, estuaries, and canals. They have a long uh, body and are about the size of a wiener dog. They're a little bit stouter, um, lower to the ground, but they're about that same size as your, your average wiener dog in terms of length and weight. Uh, their toes are partially webbed uh, that allow for them to swim and dive and their, their semi-aquatic nature. 
And when we compare them to other individuals within the Mustelid family, um, they're much larger um, than the species that most closely resemble them, weasels and stoats. Um, they're much larger, much stouter. Um, they have a form that more closely resembles a marten or a fisher. Um, they're, they um, have uniformly enlarged and somewhat bushy um, and tapering tails rather than a slender cylindrical tail with a, bush, a bushy tip that's similar in, in stoats. But when we compare them to another species that we see in our rivers, river otters, um, they're much smaller and they have a much shorter and rounded tail compared to the otter's long, long tapered tail. Their fur ranges um, various shades of brown, usually from like blackish, like this individual here, to a more tawny, chocolatey color. Um, their chin and their lower lip are white. Um, as you can kind of see in this picture, sometimes they'll have some white patches on their chest, um, but their fur does not turn fully white in the winter, um, like some stoats and weasels. Rather, their, their winter fur is denser and longer than their summer coat, um, but year-round their fur is um, water resistant. Captive minks um, are used extensively in fur farming. Um, their fur is used in coats, jackets, and capes, uh, and many different color mutations have arisen from experimental breeding on fur farms. Um, so you can get your typical chocolatey brown to blackish to minks that are spotted, um, white, or even a more dilute um, grayish color. In the wild, minks eat rodents, fish, crustaceans, frogs, and birds. They're really good at fishing, um, not quite as good as river otters, but their diet mainly consists of fish um, and muskrats, especially in our area. We have lots of them. Um, and like other mustelids, they kill their prey by biting the back of their neck or head to paralyze them. And one of my favorite things about the group of mustelids um, is that they often take on prey that are larger than them. They're very bold, aggressive individuals. Um, and in the case of minks, they'll take down large birds um, like gulls or cormorants. Um, and they, again, kill it by biting it back of its neck and usually drowning these birds. They're found throughout North America, um, not, well, not throughout North America, doesn't include Mexico, but throughout Canada um, and much of the U.S., they're very common in Wisconsin, and you can even see them in urban areas like in Milwaukee. I've seen many along the Milwaukee River. Um, so when you're in our parks or um, anywhere along, along our rivers, keep an eye out for little minks among the rocks or swimming in the water. And that's minx, so I'll turn it over to Nino. Awesome. I'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully do it right. Um, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, how to break free from plastics in five steps. And I'm going to get to present mode. Um, my topic kind of covers um, or touches all the other topics that were discussed today. It affects all the life that we talked about today. And um, think of this as a kind of like an Instagram recipe that you see, um, which it feels like it's, you know, it's going to take you 30 seconds to make that dish, but actually it takes four, five hours. Um, so just understanding that um, this is a larger topic, but I'm trying to put it in five steps as I was told to use five minutes. Um, so before we talk about plastics and why we want to break free from it, here's a quick stat on um, how much plastics enters into Great Lakes every year. 22 million pounds um, goes into um, just the Great Lakes and 11 million of those actually end up in Lake uh, Michigan. 
as that is the lake that is surrounded by uh, densely populated cities um, compared to the other Great Lakes. Um, so what whatever trash you see in Lake Michigan and in our beaches um, is our own trash. Um, another uh, quick thing to know about plastic is that eventually plastic turns into microplastic. So a lot of times when you are walking on a beach, you don't see it littered beaches because it mostly breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. What it doesn't do is ever go away. Um, it just becomes smaller and smaller, but it never completely biodegrades. Um, and so this is how it lives in our ecosystem for the most part. I'm just letting you all know I'm going to do a better job than everybody else in keeping track of time. Um, 91% of um, all the plastic that gets into recycling stream does not get recycled. So only 9% of everything that we put in our blue bins or green bins, whatever color you have, and we think is going to get recycled, um, does not go um, into um, the recycling process. Also knowing that like out of all the things that we put in the recycling, very few things can actually be recycled. Um, so knowing that is also really, really important as to what plastics are actually recyclable. And if you know, I want to know a quick answer to that. Um, number one, two, and five have the highest market value in the recycling market. And so those are the ones that are more likely to get recycled than any other uh, plastics. Um, I would not recommend recycling number six, which is polystyrene, uh, commonly known as styrofoam. Don't put that in recycling, whatever you do. So how do we break free from plastic in five steps? Here is your Instagram crash course. Um, the first simple step is to simply refuse. Um, it is as easy as it sounds. Uh, however, um, it takes practice to actually master it. Um, wh what can you refuse to start with? Any single servings, if you're taking a takeout, um, think of your condiments, think of your um, single serving containers for snacks, or spoon if you're going to eat at home. Do you need that? No. So just constantly saying no to single servings, um, straws, freebies, promotional items. Uh, we all go to places where there's um, a, always a table handing out something free, and it's really hard to say no. It's tempting to get that free swag home. Most of it is made with plastic, if you think about it. Even those um, reusable grocery totes that they hand out sometimes, um, they're actually made with plastics. Um, a quick plug on plastics, uh, if you do not know, that plastic actually comes from um, oil, basically petroleum. Um, and so um, it is a finite source. Uh, we're going to eventually run out of it. Um, and so what plastics should not be used as, as a single use item. That's something you use one time and throw away. Um, party favors is one of my favorite ones to say no to because a lot of times it's like little trinkets that are probably, you know, going to be used one time and thrown away. Um, T-shirts too. Um, oftentimes, actually, 70, more than 70% of all our garments now um, contain synthetic fiber. Uh, which could be polyester, nylon, um, you know, Gore-Tex, all those things. And so a lot of t-shirts are polyester blend. So if you are, you know, um, running a marathon or doing uh, some kind of a, a walk or event and you are offered a t-shirt, one of the easy ways is to just say no um, if you have enough t-shirts at home. Um, another easy thing to think uh, to refuse is a holiday waste. Um, depending on whatever holiday you celebrate, there's always an extra waste that comes along with it. So just figuring out if you really need um, holiday napkins, holiday things um, is one of the easiest way you can refuse to bring plastic home. Uh, uh, the second step is need it, love it, or want it, like it. Um, this title actually I stole from a recent article um, that was published on NPR um, about impulse shopping. And I loved it so much. Um, if you get a chance, look up that article um, about how convenient it has become to just 
um, go online and use the quick buttons to add things to cart. Um, some platforms, you don't even have to add to cart. You can just click one button and it buys it for you. Um, oftentimes that um, leads to unnecessary and wanted stuff. It comes in a lot of packaging that sometimes cannot be recycled. Um, so I broke that need it, love it, want it, like it into two sections. Do you really need something? Um, and do you really like what you need and need to buy? Then buy it. Or do you just want it and you like it and it's cool or it's something that's popping up on your timeline? Um, or you whispered it to friend and AI listened to it and now you're getting all kinds of ads for it. Whatever it is, just think about like how you really want to be mindful when you're making purchases. If you do buy online things, um, and if that is the way you would like to continue, um, think about clubbing items. So hold on. Uh, you know, most of the platforms offer free shipping. Um, so instead of like waiting for clubbing the items together, we just go and buy one time one item at a time. So you have five packages coming um, to your doorstep. So think about if you can wait and do all those purchases at the same time. I do think that some of the platforms, I'm being very careful not to use any names, but some of the platforms will allow you um, to say, would you like to ship it all together? That means it will be delayed by a couple of days. Um, so just plan ahead when you're doing online shopping and don't use the one click buy button option, whatever it's called. Um, so that can avoid um, some of the unnecessary packaging, unnecessary waste. If you are looking to make a switch from plastic products to uh, plastic free products, um, I highly recommend doing one change at a time. Um, living plastic free life is uh, almost impossible, but cutting it down is possible. However, it is like doing a new workout. And if you add two minutes or from workouts, you're just going to have a very sore body and you're not going to like it. So changing it one time, um, one item at a time is a great way. I have some samples of here, like um, how you can swap from plastic to not plastic. But before you make any swaps, just make sure you actually really know what your trash looks like because you can't change what you don't know. And so knowing what to throw away can really help you figure out what you wanna change. Um, our lives look very different. Um, so it is not like one size fit all. And so you make sure what is important to you, you change that first. And that can look very different in different households. So prioritize what you wanna change and work towards it, um, make it a fun project. The way I recommend doing it is you can make a swap from easy swaps to hardest so you ease into it or you can decide that which is the one that you want to make the most impact and you can switch to that first and then go on to the other swaps. Um, it is up to you which one you choose. Um, I personally recommend easy to hard. However, if you're already there, then you can choose the worth versus death. So if you buy a whole lot of something that creates a lot of waste, try switching that first. Um, and then create a plan for making these swaps because some of these swaps can um, be heavy on budget. So being creative with your budget and plan can help you um, ease into these plastic swaps. Um, this is January 1st, week of January, and a lot of people have New Year resolutions. So if you have made a resolution to... Um, reduce plastic waste. Don't throw away all the plastic that you already have in the house and don't go cold turkey on it because it almost always fails. Um, so go slow, take it easy. Um, another thing is that another step, this is my favorite step, which we have been practicing in our house for a while now is a give a gift of labor. Um, instead of buying items um, to your loved ones and to your family members, um, consider buying a gift of time. That is one of the greatest gifts in today's day and age you can give to anybody. Um, go have a coffee with a friend um, as a gift. Take them out for dinner. Um, you know, just spend some time with them. Go for a walk. That's something so easy to do. How, however, we don't find time to do this anymore. Um, we all have a friend who loves something that we make or cook. 
uh, and you know that can be a great way to give a gift is to you know either give the recipe or make it make that dish for them without any reason and give it to them um that is another great gift you can do and th think of local experiences buy a ticket to a movie um you know give a membership to a local museum so instead of going online or going in the store and buying something physical um, these are some of the greatest ways you can actually reduce any waste, not just plastic, um, from your life. And then the last one, uh, which I think is really important, is keep learning about how you can reduce plastics and what it does to the environment. Uh, our plastic um, regulations keep changing constantly, and every single year there's a different rule. So keep learning the rules. What does your municipality take, what it doesn't? Don't wash cycle. Here are some of the examples of wash cycling. So learn about what are the best ways you can recycle so you can avoid contamination and keep on growing and learning. And know that you are not going to get there overnight, just like you can't make Instagram recipe in 30 seconds. Um, and that is all I have for plastics.